Well, good morning, CBC family. My name is Eddie. If I don't know you, I'm the youth director here at CBC. Turn to Psalm 66 in your copy of scripture if you have that with you this morning. We're in Psalm 66 today, and I hope that as you are turning there in your scriptures that we keep that spirit of worship that we have had this morning as we've been led by Mike and the worship team, as we've prayed, as we've gotten to hear about what God is doing in the Czech Republic. I hope we've been worshiping in our hearts and worshiping God through that, and we get to continue to worship as we hear him from his word as well, as we hear God's word to us through scripture as we apply it to our lives, we are worshiping. We're praising God as we do that. So let's keep that spirit of worship alive in our hearts as we hear him speak to us. Well, if you look at Psalm 66 at the very beginning, in the uh, subtitle of the psalm, you could say it says, to the choir master, a song, a psalm. It doesn't have an author that is uh, recorded. It doesn't, isn't put in any historical context. We don't know what was going on in the author's life when we read this psalm like we do with some of David's psalms. We just see it's a general song that is to be sung in praise and worship to God. It's for all of God's people to come together and worship. It's a call to worship. And it calls us to see God's, his awesome deeds, his glorious character revealed through his awesome deeds and to bring him worship and praise for those deeds. Charles Spurgeon sums up this psalm well. He says of Psalm 66 that praise is the topic of this psalm, and the subjects for praise are worship, or for worship, are the Lord's great works, his gracious benefits, his faithful deliverances, and all his dealings with his people. So praise, what it means for us to come together and to worship God as his people, is the topic that we are being taught about here. And it's important to remember, we don't naturally praise God on our own. We don't naturally worship him due um, just to our sin, to our sinful nature. We don't have that ability to come and worship God on our own. We need to be led to worship, and that's what the psalmist does by reminding us of God's amazing works. And so he tells us to come and see God's awesome deeds and worship. Come and see what God has done for you here in this passage, and let that lead you to bring him worship and praise. And when we reflect on that, when we reflect on what he's done for us, we see that his awesome deeds demand three things. They demand the worship from the nations, they demand the joy of his people, and they demand an individual, personal response. So they demand these three things when we look at God's deeds. So let's begin reading verse 1. We see that God's deeds demand the worship of the nations. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. And so the psalmist says, shout for joy, praise God with all the nations, with all the earth for his awesome deeds. We're being invited and we're being called to worship. But before we go further, We need to make sure we're on the same page about what that word awesome means because that word awesome is thrown around quite a lot these days. And it's not just the trivial adjective that we can describe God's works with as well as an action movie, a football game, or your favorite home-cooked meal. The word awesome does not mean the same things. The root word uh, in the Hebrew language means to fear, essentially, to fear, to cause trembling and reverence and awe Older translations uh, in the English would say, in verse 3, say to God, how terrible are your deeds. The idea that they cause some sort of awe and reverence and respect in us. It's the same sort of reverence when we look up from the base of a mountain and we think about how long this trail is going to be and maybe question if we're really wanting to hike it that bad. Or if we look out on the vast endlessness of the ocean and we wonder about what is just below the surface, maybe there's a little bit of fear and trembling there. Or if we just stare off into the night sky and think about how small we really are. That's what the psalmist wants us to feel when we we ponder, when we reflect on God's awesome deeds. That's that sort of awe and reverence he wants us to have. And here in these first four verses, as he's calling all the earth to worship, he is saying, Come and see God as creator and as ruler, these deeds that reveal his great power. 
we see that as creator, all of his creation will worship. Ultimately, all of his creation will come and praise him. And we also see that he is so powerful as ruler, if you look in verse 3, he says, so great is your power that your enemies come cringing or bowing down to him in acknowledgement of who he is. Even his enemies cannot not worship. So the psalmist is saying to us, look at this powerful God. Look at this creator, this ruler of earth that everyone and all of creation is going to worship. So why would we not want to join in in singing hymn praise? Why would we not want to be a part of worshiping our creator and ruler? And you know, Jesus says something similar in Luke 19. You may know this. When he's going into Jerusalem, it's the triumphal entry a week before he's going to be crucified. Uh, all these people are worshiping him. They're praising Jesus, putting down, you know, the palm branches, singing hallelujah, all that stuff. You probably know that story. And the Pharisees, they come up to Jesus and they say, hey, can you tell all these people to shut up, essentially? They ask him to tell them all to be quiet. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, I tell you that if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The very rocks would cry out. So no matter what, God will get the praise that he is due. He will get the worship you will receive the praise that he is worthy of. And, but the psalmist point is, why would we not want to be a part of that? Why would we not want to join in with all of creation in worshiping our God? So the whole world, we see, gets the opportunity to worship. That's the idea here. These opening verses, they are a call for us to worship, to come together, to praise him, to shout for joy, to sing, to give him praise, to tell God how great he really is. Not that he doesn't know, but we're called to till, still tell him. And so that is the desire of the psalmist that we see here in Psalm 66, that all people would come and praise God. And that ought to be our own heart's desire as well, should it not? We should also desire to see people from every tribe and tongue and nation worship, knowing and worshiping our God. Not just for us to have that opportunity to worship him with our lives, but to bring the gospel to all the nations so that all people would have the opportunity to know and worship God as well. This is what missions is ultimately about. Uh, John Piper says in his book, let the nations be glad that missions exist because worship doesn't. We want all people, whether it's someone across town or across your street, across the country or across the world, or even just across the hallway in your home, we want to make worshipers of all people we want to bring all people to a saving knowledge of God where they can worship him and praise him with their lives. No matter who it is, we want all people to come and worship our God as we get the privilege to do. And we know that every knee will bow down, that every tongue will confess on heaven, in heaven and on earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ultimately, everyone will, whether in this life or the next. And so we want to call people to worship him and know him now. We want, him to, want them to come and worship our God and know him as Savior and Lord and not just as judge later on. We want to bring the message of God's deeds to the nations. This is, you know, what Jesus commanded us to do when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. Essentially, it's go and make worshipers of all nations as well. And something that's super interesting in Psalm 66, I think, and we'll see it as we keep going, is that the psalmist starts with this very broad perspective. He's calling all of the earth, all people to come and worship God. And then he's going to move on, and he's going to talk to God's people specifically in a more corporate sense. And then he's going to finish up the psalm with a very personal testimony of how God worked in his own life. In Psalm 67, the psalm we're going to look at next week, it is the opposite order. It starts out very personal well, about how the Lord has blessed the psalmist in Psalm 67. Then it goes to all of his people. And then there is also a desire in Psalm 67 that all the nations would come to know and fear and worship God. In Psalm 67 too, it says, we want your way to be known among all the earth, your saving power among all nations. So let the nations be glad and sing for joy that's that desire there, that all nations would come to know and rejoice in God. And that, is, that ought to be our desire, as well as we think about the opportunity and the privilege we have to worship God every week at church and every day in our own personal lives. We want to give that opportunity to other pe people. We want to bring that message of what God has done so that all people have the opportunity to know and worship him. And so we see 
that God's awesome deeds, they do not only demand the worship of the nations, but also the joy of his people. Like I said, it, go, it goes to a more uh, corporate sense. It narrows down the view of the psalmist here. So look at verse 5. He says, come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. So again, he begins to narrow his view. He's called all the earth to come together and worship. And now specifically we, as God's people, we have that privilege. We have that responsibility to call people to know him and worship him. And while the nations see God as just a ruler, we as his people know him in a different, special, and unique way. And that's what the psalmist is going to keep talking about. Of how our, and he's referring to Israel as well, but we can see this clearly for us too, that our collective experience of God's work for us as his people, it informs how we can praise him in a unique way. We can praise him in a special way. We can come to him with joy and thankfulness in a special way because of what he has done for us as his people. And we see that we can have thanks to God and joy in his redemption and in his preservation are the two ideas that are written up here, in his redemption and preservation. So look at verse 6 now. It says that he turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. And so you probably see that the, the writer here is referring back to the Exodus when God brought the people out of Egypt, part of the Red Sea, and they came through the waters there. And that serves as the Old Testament paradigm for God's saving work for his people. All throughout the Old Testament, you see it pointed back to the parting of the Red Sea, to the Exodus, as this was the saving work that God did for his people, that he brought them up out of a land of slavery and eventually into the promised land. And so the psalmist is writing hundreds of years later. He was not there. He was not there at the time when God parted the Red Seas and when Moses led them through the water. But I think what is so amazing, that look at the end of verse 6. Although he was not there, the psalmist says, there did we rejoice in him who rules forever and whose eyes keep watch on the nations. There did we rejoice in him. I think that's amazing that the psalmist, the writer here, is able to identify with all of the people of Israel because of what God did for them to redeem them. And again, even though he was not there the hundreds of years prior, there is a unified corporate joy that he can share with all of God's redeemed people. And I hope you see where I'm probably going with this. One commentator says on Psalm 66 that Christian readers of this psalm can join in on the celebration with enthusiasm. After all, we are reminded of an even greater deed of salvation, the cross of Christ. The second and the greatest act of redemption that we see in Scripture is that of the work of Jesus. And like the psalmist, for us, the cross of Christ, that was thousands of years ago. What Jesus did for us was thousands of years ago. But through his work on the cross, we can find our own redemption out of slavery. And we can find our own redemption there at the foot of the cross. And we can say with all of the church from all time, there do we rejoice in our God as well because he redeemed us. He brought us out. He rules all the nations. He is over all peoples and he wants them all to come and to know him and submit to him as Lord and Savior and know him not just as ruler, but as a God who is redeemer as well. And so we can look back and we can look to the cross, and we can say, there do we rejoice in our God, just like these people were able to then. And I think what's interesting as well, at the end of verse 7, the writer says, let not the rebellious exalt themselves. I think that's just an interesting phrase to throw in there, but the point is, do not exalt yourself beyond seeing your need for God's redeeming work in your life. Don't see that you are, don't think that you are beyond the need for God to do a work in your life through Jesus. And so maybe you've never accepted that free gift of the gospel that we talk about every week here at CBC. And maybe it's because you think you're really not that bad because you don't do the really, really bad things and you do do the really good things for the most part. And you come to church pretty regularly, so you really don't need Jesus to come and give you a new heart and cleanse you and forgive you because you're just not that bad. But the psalmist says, don't exalt yourself. You are never above or beyond needing Jesus to work in your life. You are never above or beyond needing God to do a work of redeeming you. James says something similar when he says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace 
to the humble. So submit yourself to God, and if so, he will draw near to you. So if you haven't placed your faith in Christ, if, if you don't know him, if you can't come together and celebrate him as a redeemer, you can know him, you can submit to him, you can know him and be redeemed from your sin. And many of, you, many of us here, I think most of us here at church, we know that privilege, we know that joy of being able to look to our redemption at the cross of Christ. And that's what we get to come here every week and celebrate as God's people. And I hope that we can all joyfully say, like this psalmist, when we look back, when we reflect on what Jesus has done for us, we can say, there do we rejoice in our God who redeemed us. There, together as God's people, we can look to and worship and find the joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ, which is pretty amazing. And I feel like we could stop there and just celebrate that fact for all morning. But the psalmist doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He doesn't even stop at just how God redeems his people. He keeps going to talk about how God preserves his people as well or sustains them. So look at verse 8. He says, Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. So the people whom God redeems, he also keeps. He preserves them. He does not let them go. He says, God has kept our soul among the living. He has not let our feet slip. Once you are in the family of God, there is no way out. He will preserve you. He will care for you. He will keep you and sustain you. But I think what is interesting here and maybe rubs up against what we like to think is what it really means for God to preserve us. And if you look at these verses we just read, I really like what the psalmist says in verses 8 and 9 at the beginning and what he says at the very end of verse 12. Those sound nice. For God to keep us, to keep our soul among the living, not let our feet slip, bring us out to a place of abundance. That sounds pretty nice to me. I bet it does to you as well. But look at verse 10. This is what it means for God to keep us as his people. He says, you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You bring us into the net. You have laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through the water. I don't like that part quite as much. I don't know about you. But I hope we all know that as God's people, as believers, trials and hardships and difficulties, those are to be expected. It's a reality. We see that all throughout Scripture. First Peter says something similar in chapter 1. It says, You rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's testing, trials, they are a reality for all of us, as the psalmist says. It was for Israel back in this time as they... Um, still had people in the land that were oppressing them and had all these other problems going on. Eventually they were brought into exile, wilderness wanderings, all those things. They were times of testing that God was using for them. And God is using these times of trials in our own lives as well. And I think it's important to note, God doesn't just allow these hard things to happen in our lives, does he? In verse 11 it says that God brought us into the net. God is the one who laid the crushing burden in our back, on our backs. He himself is the one bringing the trial into your life to test you and to keep your faith. And sometimes he even uses the actions of other people, of evil people, to test you. As he says in verse 12, you let men ride over our heads. And so, just like we as God's corporate people, just like we can celebrate and rejoice in his redemption together, we can also come together and say in unique ways and from different experiences that we went through the fire and the water, like the psalmist says here, that we've been put through the ringer. And when we look at scripture, we see that it's going to happen. It's the reality of following Jesus. It's to be expected that trials will come. But we all probably know that doesn't make them easier, does it? And I'm sure that some of you maybe feel like you've just come through the fire and come through the water and come through the trial, and maybe you can finally breathe. And some of us might be naively optimistic, thinking that, you know, they really won't come. They really won't come. The trials aren't going to happen. And some of us are worried, probably thinking, 
God's next trial in our life is right around the corner, and we're just dreading when some problem's going to pop up. And some of you right now, I'm sure, are in the fire, and you're in the water, and God is bringing you through that trial right now. And you feel like you're drowning, maybe. But no matter where you are, the psalmist says that through the hardship, through the difficulty, through these problems of life, he says at the end of verse 12, you have brought us out to a place of abundance, which again sounds really, really nice. <laughs> it's like you've been stumbling through the woods and you finally come to this clearing where you can get some rest, where you can sit down and look around and breathe a little bit. And I hope we all know, just like, I, just like we did for the word awesome, we have to reorient ourselves to what he probably means when he says a place of abundance. It is trial, God's going to increase your bank account. He's going to make everything work out and fix every problem in your situation. It doesn't mean he's going to mend every broken relationship or heal every sickness or health. But when the psalmist says a place of abundance, he means a place where God is found. A place where we have a greater spiritual intimacy with our Lord than we did before the trial. That now our faith is stronger and tested and we know God in a more meaningful way. Through trials, we don't just scrape by the, by, by the skin of our teeth. God brings you through trials to know him and to love him and worship him in a greater, more meaningful way than you could before the trial. I'm reminded of what Paul says in Romans 8. This lines up really well with what we've been doing in youth group as we've been going through Romans 8, and we just went through this passage, but Paul says in Romans 8 that, in verse 28, we know that for those who love God, you probably know this verse, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And that sounds great. Again, that sounds great just like this place of abundance sounds to us. But what is the good that Paul has in mind? What is the purpose that God has in mind for you and me? What is the place of abundance that the psalmist writes about? Verse 29 in Romans 8 answers too, where it says, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So God's purposes for you and God's purposes for me in every situation in your life is that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, that you would look and be more like Jesus, essentially, that you would have a greater spiritual intimacy with God, that you would know the Father in a deeper way, that you would walk by the Spirit's power in your life, that through every situ situation in your life, good or bad, God is working for your good to bring you to a place of abundance, to keep you to preserve you, to sustain you, to draw you closer to him. And he's doing this in every one of our lives. In every situation, every single one of us are going through today, you know, this week, this month, this year. God is doing that good purpose in your life to bring you to a place where you can know him in a more meaningful way. And the psalmist's point is that we can come together, we can celebrate what God is doing in all of our lives, varied and unique experiences we are all having, but we can come together and celebrate that he has good purposes for us, even in the trials and in the hardships. And so we see that God's awesome deeds demand worship from the nations, the joy of his people, and lastly, there's an individual and personal response that God's deeds demand as well. We, again, we see that movement from this worldwide view of all people coming to praise God to, to God's corporate, his chosen people, rejoicing in what he's done for them. And then finally, there's a really personal nature to the last verses of Psalm 66. And while we reflect on the awesome deeds of God, on what he has done for us, we see that there is a need for our own response. And so there's something for you and I to do here. There's something for us to ponder about our own lives and our own walk with God. And when we reflect on God's awesome deeds and we see him as ruler, redeemer, keeper, sustainer, that demands a response. And the psalmist has two responses in mind. And first, there is a determination to sacrifice. So look at verse 13, a determination to sacrifice. He says, I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fat and animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. So great. And we want to really apply this. So there is an altar at the front. And I hope you all brought your goats, your sheep, your rams. We're going to just have you line up, come start sacrificing, slaughtering, which we're not going to do. I hope you don't think I'm being serious. Um, we're not going to do that, right? The author is clearly writing from a, an old covenant context mind. 
um, an old covenant minded context. So he has pondered God's wondrous works. He's called all creation to worship. He has reflected on what God is doing and how all of the earth needs to come worship him. He's reflected on God, how God has redeemed and is sustaining and keeping his people, his covenant people. And so now he's reflecting on his own commitment to the Lord. He's reflecting on his own personal commitment to God, and he's determined to live out his commitment to God. He's determined to live out his obligation to his Lord, which is an awesome picture. It's cool to, to see his personal dedication to coming and to making these sacrifices. And I hope that as we reflect on who God is, as we've seen his wondrous works, as we've looked in the psalm and seen what he is saying about our God, that our hearts are also kindled with uh, our own fresh sense of commitment that I hope your heart and my heart are, um, we have a new determination ourselves to, to be committed to our God. We need to determine in our hearts to give God what we ought to give, but we live in a New Testament context. We're not going to really slaughter some sheep up front, which I'm thankful for. We don't have to make these types of sacrifices anymore. And uh, if you were in Ed and I's equip class a few weeks ago, you'll know where I'm going with this. Um, Christ himself, the author of Hebrews, has made a once-for-all sacrifice, the author of Hebrews says. Christ made a once-for-all sacrifice, so there's no more need for rams or goats or sheep or anything like that. We're all good. We're all good on that front. There has been one sacrifice made once for all, and that was Jesus. And so the only sacrifice we need to bring to God, therefore, is ourselves. It's our lives. Paul says it well in Romans 12. You probably know this verse too, where he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So God doesn't ask you to this morning to come and bring dead animals as some uh, sign of your renewed commitment to him. He only asks you to lay down your life. <laughs> so a little bit harder of a task, actually. He only asks you to lay down your life to him, to submit to his lordship, his plan, and his direction in your life. And so when you reflect on God's goodness, when you reflect on the amazing things he's done for you, and how he's working all things for your good, why would you, why would you not want to give your life to him? You can know that he has a good plan for you. You can know he has a good purpose in your life. And so you can confidently sacrifice yourself, lay down yourself as a living sacrifice to God and to his plan for your life. He deserves and demands your sacrifice of yourself. And so the psalmist sees, uh, he has this determination of sacrifice. And then lastly, he has a desire to share, to share about what God has done. So look at verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. So blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. So lastly, we see the psalmist desires to share what God has done in his life. And so he says to anyone who will listen, anyone who fears God, come and hear. God has done such an amazing work in his life, he can't keep quiet about it. Uh, it's like in the Gospel of Mark, as we've been going through Mark in the fall and the spring, that as Jesus is healing people and doing all these amazing things, uh, whenever he does an amazing thing in someone's life, they just want to run off and tell their friends and tell their family, and Jesus has to be like, all right, Keep it quiet. I don't want everyone to know right now. He has to keep them quiet because they just want to go tell about what Jesus did for them. When we experience something amazing in our lives, we have to share. We can't keep it to ourselves. This last weekend, Elizabeth and I were up in Bend, and we went to these, these caves, these lo like this lava river cave. I don't know if you've ever been in Bend and seen that, but it was really cool. I don't know. It was awesome. Like We just had some flashlights, and we just kind of walked a mile down into this cave, and I don't know. That was really fun, and I think people should do that, so I want, to, I want to tell people about that so they can go see that for themselves as well. That's the idea the psalmist has here. He wants to share what God has done in his life because he can't keep it to himself. He, himself. he wants other people to come and see and know and worship God and see what he is doing. And what I think is so amazing is here in this verse, he says, come in here, all you who fear God, and he says, well, he doesn't say, I will tell you what he has done to fix my problem. He doesn't say, I will tell you how God got rid of that trial in my life, how this circumstance worked out really well, how God fixed my problem the way I wanted it to be fixed. He doesn't say that. He says, I will tell you 
what God has done for my soul, which is amazing. He'll, he says, I'll tell you what God has done in my heart, in my life. He doesn't want to share about how his circumstances worked out perfectly, how God fixed his problem. He wants to share what God did internally, what God did in his heart and in his life. He wants to tell about how God drew him to himself, how God brought this writer to a place of abundance like we talked about earlier, how he brought him to a place of knowing and worshiping God in a greater way. That's what he wants to share. Not, again, how God fixed some problem, but about how God drew him to himself in a greater, more meaningful way. And so we see his testimony in those following verses where he says that he cried to the Lord with his mouth. He brought him praise. He came to God, and he says that he couldn't have cherished his sin. He couldn't come to God and still love his sin. He knows it doesn't work like that. So he says, I fought to cherish God, and the Lord listened to my prayer. He has heard my voice. He has listened. And the psalmist confidently says that the Lord has not rejected his prayer or taken away his steadfast love. So that's his personal testimony that he shares with us when he says, come, let me tell you about what God has done for my soul. He has done this for me. And I hope and I know that we all have these stories of God's grace working in our lives. And I hope we all have the willingness to say, like the writer here, come and let me tell you about what God has done for my soul. I hope we all have that willingness and that desire to tell one another what God is doing in our lives. In this trial, in this blessing, this hard circumstance, this good time in my life, this relationship, let me tell you about what God has done, not to fix those things, but what God has done in my heart and in my soul, how he drew me to himself. And if you're a believer this, here this morning, I hope you want to share what, about what God's doing in your life. Um, when he, commenting on this psalm, John Calvin says that redeemed men and women don't need to look any further than themselves in order to find the best grounds for reverencing and praising God. And this morning, if you need your own heart stirred to worship, look no further than what God has done for you. If you feel like you have nothing to say to other believers because you maybe find it difficult to relate, just share what God has done for you. Or if you are shared to scare the gospel and you don't know how to communicate it well, just share, again, what God has done for you. And as we look at the amazing things that God has done in our lives, as we reflect on them here, how could we not share them? How could we not share how God has redeemed us out of our own slavery to sin through Christ's work on the cross? How could we not share how God brings us through trials to a place of knowing him and loving him and worshiping him in a more meaningful way? Why would we not want to tell people about what God has and is doing in our lives? Why would we not want to share it? And I'm just going to say, family, these stories of God's grace are what we must be sharing with one another as we gather together as God's people. You don't know how God can use the story of his grace in your life to make an impact in someone else's life. But he can, and he will, if you open your mouth and just start to share about what he's doing. Because I know I need to hear those stories of God's grace in your life, and you, I think, need to hear them in other, from other people as well. And this is what community and fellowship is all about. That's why we have it in our church's name. It's not just about grabbing coffee and trying to talk about anything but God. <laughs> it's not just trying to find every topic we can even find to talk about besides God. It's not about just kind of sneaking in late and avoiding talking to Pastor Pete at the door and trying to sit in the back and get out before the service is over. That's not what community is about either. It's about coming together and celebrating God's work in our life and sharing about how his grace is working in our lives, sharing those stories of his grace because we all need to hear them. So as we look at Psalm 66, the psalmist wants you, he wants me, he wants us to reflect on what God has done he wants us to see the truth about who God is as creator, as ruler, and to be involved with bringing this message to the nations so that all people can come and worship him. We have that task that Jesus gave us to go and make disciples, make worshipers of all people, and call them to know and love and worship the triune God. And then he also wants us to gather together as God's people and celebrate what he's done for all of us, how he's redeemed us, and he's brought us out of our slavery to sin. We don't come to church just because it's something we feel like we have to do, just because we like the songs we sing, or we like looking at the really good-looking preachers. We come... <laughs> that one really hit, yeah. <laughs> we come to church every week to gather together as God's people and celebrate how he has redeemed us, how he has saved us through Christ, and how he's holding on to us and sustaining us 
and not letting us go through every one of life's troubles. So we come together in church to rejoice and celebrate in God. And then finally, as we just talked about, he wants us to reflect on how God is working in all of our lives in a personal way. And I, as we just talked about, I hope that you have a renewed sense of your own commitment to God, that you would have a desire to lay down your life as a living sacrifice. And I don't know what that means for you. Uh, maybe there's something you need to lay down or give up to God, but we all need to lay down our lives as a living sacrifice in some sort of way. And then lastly, he says, I want you to have that desire to share what God has done in your own soul, in your own heart. Speak up and tell others what God has done and is doing in your life, CBC family. How God brought you to a place of trusting him no, more, of a closer walk with him, to being more like Jesus. Share those stories, please, of how God has worked in your life, because we all need to hear them, as I just said. And I know there's an abundance of stories of God's amazing grace sitting in this room, and so we need to hear and be encouraged by those. So as we, as we conclude, we see God is really great. We see that in this psalm. He's very great, but we also see how good he is to us. As the psalmist ends in verse 20, blessed be God, he has not rejected his, our prayers or removed his steadfast love from us. Nothing can separate you from God's love for you in Jesus Christ. God himself is your highest good, and he is great in all of his deeds towards us. He is awesome. He really is awesome in the fullest sense of that word. So as we finish up this morning by continuing to worship in prayer and in song and then hopefully going out and celebrating what God is doing in our lives and sharing that, let's, um, let's just praise him for being the awesome God that he really, really is. So let me pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for your awesome deeds as we have reflected on this morning, how you have created us. You rule over your creation. You have redeemed us um, from the slavery to our sin. From <laughs> out of slavery to our sin through the cross of Christ, and you keep us, you don't let us go, you don't let our feet slip. And so, God, I pray that we would reflect on our own commitment to you, that we would reflect on how we can share the stories of your grace with one another, with those who are around us. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.